are back on the Zero Hour. I am your host, Richard R.J. Escal. Joining me now, and once again, is our good friend, Thomas Frank. Uh, we're, well, we'll tell you what we're, we'll, we'll be talking about in a minute. We'll be talking about Tom's latest column. But Thomas Frank, as you already know, is an American political analyst. He's a historian, he's a journalist and a commentator. His latest book is The People, comma, No, and Oh. He's also apparently a fashion critic since he doesn't <laughs> like my glasses, so I'll take them off just to make Tom comfortable. So uh, without any further ado, Thomas Frank, welcome back to the Zero Hour. Richard, it's great to be here, and I'm sorry for what I said about your glasses. I uh, I'll just be if you, please, if you, need, if you need those glasses, please wear them and ignore everything I said. I don't need them. Just thank God I have them. Um, so you wrote a piece recently. Once again, uh, Thomas Frank, we uh, we think alike. Uh, the head, I don't know if you wrote the headline or not. Probably. I not. never. I never write headlines. I mean, never. <laughs> few of us do, but yeah. But, Liberal, the headline in The Guardian is liberals want to blame right wing misinformation, quote unquote, for our problems. Get real in progressive circles these days is the subheader. There is a palpable horror of the uncurated world. Of no, I wrote that. That I wrote. Yeah, that's very Tom Frank. Yeah. Of <laughs> thought spaces flourishing outside the consensus. You know, this is something I've been on for a while now, this sort of liberal and and a few others as well you know our mutual friend matt taibbi among others but uh this notion it seems to me a historical but i may have missed certain i may have forgotten uh, or be overlooking certain historical moments maybe the 1950s but mainstream americrat um, american democratic liberalism seems to be embracing uh, a level of censorship and and sort of developing a visceral attraction to cen censorship on a level I haven't seen in uh, ever actually. Yep, yep, you're right. You were right. Well, not in our lifetimes. Yeah, I mean, there there was one period that you can point to when liberals were really into censorship, and that's World War One, when the uh, I mean the, the that was the you know the Woodrow Wilson era, and right. uh, Wilson was you know a liberal. I mean, let's let's face it. And his, you know, his his administration was was very progressive on a lot of issues, but also not so progressive on a certain number of other issues. And one of them was uh, was World War One. Uh, you know, they they made it illegal to criticize the war. Uh, you know, to, right. to speak out against it, to try to dissuade people from joining the army. Is that uh, what he? Et cetera, et cetera. Is that That's what Debs, yeah, Debs got yeah, busted for that. that law, yep. They went after, yeah, and they shut down a whole lot of publications or banned. I mean, they they didn't do it directly. They did. They were, censorship is always done indirectly. Uh, so they uh, they they banned them from the mail. But well, that's tantamount to putting them out of business. Right. So uh, as I was, uh, you know, my one of my favorite magazines of all time was called The Masses. You probably well, maybe you haven't heard of it, but it, it had. Oh, uh, I have heard of it. Yeah, I'm the only uh, other one listening who has, but I yeah, <laughs> yeah, I know. No, uh, uh, Max Eastman was the editor. Jack Reed was the star writer, and the cartoons were by a guy called Art Young, who is just spectacular. And uh, they were uh, really critical of the war, and the government shut them down. They uh, they also basically destroyed um, well the, uh, uh, an important. Uh, sort of relic of the populist era, which was called the Appeal to Reason. It was a socialist newspaper published in Girard, Kansas. It had started as a populist newspaper, had moved when populism died, it moved over to the Socialist Party and was still going. In fact, it had an enormous circulation at the time of World War One and opposed World War One. And they uh, they got into huge trouble and they had to change their editorial policy or else go out of business. And that had the effect of basically killing them when they when they did that, when they knuckled under it. So it's not. Uh, yeah. It, 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 and they in, in addition, Eugene Debs, who was one of the main personalities at the Appeal to Reason, he wrote for it all the time. And they, they sort of covered him like, you know, he was this hero figure. Uh, he gave a speech opposing the war and they, they, the administration threw him in prison. Seriously, he went to a federal, right. um, you know, the 
federal penitentiary in Atlanta, Georgia. They shut down uh, German and German language newspapers all over America. The right. German American community, you might, as you might imagine, was did not think World War One was a great idea. Uh, you know, that sort of thing. And that was liberals did that. But I've always thought that liberals learned their lesson from that chapter. I mean, it's shameful what they did. Mm -hmm. You know, they busted you. They also like IWW leaders, leaders of a, it was a radical labor union at the time. Uh, they got uh, uh, thrown in prison. Uh, they got uh, shot. They got lynched, you know, all this kind of crap. And it, it was all because of the war hysteria. Uh, and you know what's really funny about all that, Richard? World War One was a bad idea. It was. <laughs> World War One was, was like the it dumbest. Absolutely, was a bad idea. Yeah, and, and uh, but the at least, and I'm not defending it. It's horrible. I've I've written about it myself, and you know, German Americans were basically being treated, in my view, the way Muslims were, were have been treated the last fifteen right. or twenty years. Right. Their places of worship were intimidated and spied. Well, they all changed their names and stuff. This is my yeah, ancestors. So, oh. And you yeah. could quit sauerkraut. Got what well, they called it? Liberty cabbage. The uh, uh, a hamburger. They called it Salisbury steak because hamburger right. is right. Yeah. You know, in Ger Hamburg is in Germany, etc. And and so you know, but uh, then there was a war going on now, uh, and that is not in any way to excuse it. Uh, excuse it. Now we don't even have a war as an excuse. Now right. we have a sort of. Um, illusory uh, in a sort of a, a mirage of a war uh, a war against misinformation or or alternately or against, this you know, that's supposedly it, it, threatening democracy and undermining you know in this all, but it all goes back to 2016 richard to the uh, sure so like so like everything else uh, in the you know in the in this era it's like history ended then and started over again i i there's so many examples of that you know of trump's election in 2016 but liberals convinced themselves that it happened because of russian interference and uh, the 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 main uh, sort of uh, item of Russian interference that that we now are left with after you know RussiaGate and this sort of liberal hysteria of the last couple of years that most of, a lot of which turned out to not be true. I mean, Trump. Remember the the big fear was that Trump was some kind of Russian agent. Do you remember that? Well, of course. And, uh, I, yeah. Well, the, I mean, I everybody's denying that. it now. Everybody's denying that they ever made this argument, but they, they did make this argument and it turned out to not be true. And he did not have any, you know, he didn't like get together with the Russians and plan, uh, you know, his campaign strategy. There was the, the whole collusion thing was wrong. Now, it is true that the Russians bought ads on Facebook. That is true. And they uh, and that it's very interesting what they did from a sort of advertise. If you're interested in, in advertising, uh, they you know, or if you're interested in Facebook or or the way they tried to play American culture was absolutely fascinating. But uh, it was a uh, you can't really attribute Hillary Clinton's defeat to that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but nevertheless, we've all, we're all convinced that Russian what this is called misinformation, uh, these conspiracy theories that were sort of made up by Russians that that's uh, uh, that's the model, uh, and. Uh, you know, and that's uh, we're now awash in misinformation of all different kinds, either invented by Russians or invented by Americans. The classic example being QAnon, uh, you know, and these people who stormed the Capitol building a couple months ago out of this, you know, driven by because of this, this crazy conspiracy theory that they all believe. And so, yes, we are awash in falsehoods. That is true. But the first thing you got to remember, Richard, this is America. We've always been awash in falsehoods. If you go back no, and look at our... <laughs> right. No, and, and, and Tom, whether right. they come from Russia or whether they come from Madison Avenue or whether they come from fucking Hollywood. Sorry. No, that's all right. Troy just has to make a note and clean, bleep it out. I was going to say Hollywood, whether they come from Hollywood. I mean, we, we tell each other lies all the time. God, just the other day I was watching some movie, a Hollywood movie from the 30s. And I, I love old movies. This is one of my things. But they like to glorify the British Empire. Like, come on. That's uh, that's misinformation. <laughs> you well, know, see, it didn't really point. go down that way. You know? Absolutely. But uh, there's a deeper point, I think. Or or wait, the antebellum South. Remember Gone with the Wind? Oh, yes, my God. I'm sure, of course. Um, that well, didn't really happen. 
happened, folks. The, it wasn't the really like West that. The American has been romanticized. Yes, and, yes, and, yes. And, I, 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 by the way, in this our COVID, I've watched a whole lot of westerns. I never liked the westerns as a genre, but I, you know what? What the hell? I took that up, and you know, I wrote this book about um, populism, which was a movement in the West in the 1890s. You know, and a lot of guys who are on the frontier, there's even gunfights in my book. In Texas, the populace got into a gunfight with a racist militia and the, the racist militia won. You know, there's never been a movie about this, about the rise of like, wow, populism in Kansas. Yeah. It would What a movie that would be. Uh, you know, it has all sorts of fascinating characters and heroes. And, you know, you could play it any any of a bunch of different ways. Um and uh, uh, but yeah, it's just there's all of these movies about, you know, gunfighters in, in like Dodge City, Kansas, but none about populists in Topeka, Kansas, you know, Anyhow, uh, I've just actually, a thought, this is just a, a total, thought, Richard. This is a total digression, but I'm going to indulge myself. Oh, that's what we're here for, man. It's COVID. Right. <laughs> hey, Thomas Frank, <laughs> which is, you know, I had this little health stuff going on and eye surgeries and things. And um I watched a ton of Chinese and Korean like B movies and I'd never watched them before. And the political subtext in some of those is absolutely fascinating. You, I, I wonder if it's, so I've been watching some Korean movies lately. Which um, ones? Uh, what, we're the, totally I watched the Paris, the Parasite. Excellent. Oh, sure. Of course. I watched one called, um, it's about the DMZ. It's about, uh, I, I, it's, and the title is something like DMZ, but it's not. It's called. There's one, the one joint something security zone. area. Or that's something it. Like that's that. it. That's the yeah, one. Yeah, you see, wow. I'm that's, a, that's a great movie. It is a really good movie. But I've also watched some of the, you know, pot boilers, and they're <laughs> fascinating. I, like, I've always, always been a fan of Hong Kong uh gangster movie the jackie chan sort of thing well or... more uh johnny toe who's a director of these things and some of the other but um i was watching one made more recently since hong kong you know since 1998 and everything hong kong status changed and for example thomas frank at one point one of the gangsters is saying i'm going to have to go to the capital and work this out and then a little later, he calls his girlfriend or whatever. I'm in the capital. He doesn't say Beijing. About five times, he says the capital. And so why do you suppose that is? It's actually that... guidance to filmmakers in Hong Kong that it's better to use the phrase the capital to signify, ah. uh, you know, the acceptance of the new political relationship. Yes. Then because if you use the actual word, the censor can find you really easily, which brings us back to today's subject. Well done. That should have been my ah! job. <laughs> so there's this push. Now, every every one of your viewers is going to know about this because it's on like page one of the New York Times again and again and again, this push among, and one of the weirdest aspects of this drive for censorship is that the, the newspapers such as they are, the newspapers are down with it. They're in favor of They're it. They're pushing which it. Is, They're I, promoting which I, I cannot yeah. believe. I mean, given that the New York Times, it's, it's you know, it was, these were the anti-censorship. I mean, up until four years ago, this was the bulwark of, of First Amendment, right. you know, activism in America was the New York Times. There was nobody who was more of a free speech absolutist than the New York Times. And now they're like, yeah, close those people down, close those other people down. And uh, uh, there's a lot of bad faith in it. But anyhow, to get back to where we were, one of the things that they that they demand all the time is that podcasts like what you and I are doing right now, that podcasts somehow be brought under the control of some sort of uh, uh, official who can make sure that nothing wrong gets said which is just the strange, you know, because a podcast, there's no index. You can't easily do a, a text search and there's no authority to turn podcasters into, you know, you can't get them in trouble. You can't cancel them. Right. And so, and right. so this is uh, as though you could, and the funny thing is you can't really do that with newspapers either. <laughs> you can <could> try, <laughs> but uh, you know, <laughs> well, here's the thing. Uh, you know, I mean, to me, one of the underlying forces at work here, Thomas Frank, is you, you've written multiple books about not only about populism, anti-populism, but the arc of the Democratic Party away from sort of working class roots and that sort of thing. To me, what we're seeing, whether it's in the media or in some Democratic Party circles or whatever, is an embrace of authoritarianism yes. and a desire to use all the 
apparatus of state and corporation to professional professional voices. power. Yes. Yes. Well, well, Do you remember they don't they don't like and that? Yes. Do you remember the, the thesis? And we're getting putting the cart ahead of the horse here because we should first go through. I mean, and show the viewers that this is this is really happening because that's the I got two kinds of responses on uh, social media when I put this essay up. There's a lot of people that are that just don't think this is really happening. Right. And uh, uh, that's not the case. There is stories about misinformation and disinformation in The New York Times in the Washington Post, uh, on CNN, on NPR, all the time. And they always are a, a, a tantamount, they're, they're, they're always have some so implicit or explicit call for someone to crack down, usually social media companies to somehow crack down on this stuff, meaning right. Facebook should be have an active censorship program uh, and uh, or Twitter should have an active censorship program or Amazon or whatever. And uh, uh but but the 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 sort of uh, grander demand, the grander vision here is that there is a class of people who know the the correct answers to everything. And if we just right, put, if we just put those people in charge, then all our all our troubles will be over. And uh, it's it's. Do you remember the the uh, my book Listen Liberal? Sure. It's a, it's about the demo. It's a, it's an interpretation of the Democratic Party as a class party. Absolutely. But not yeah. the working class. Right. It, it's it's a party of the professional white collar elite. And this is one of the things that I've always said about that book uh, since the day it was published that, is that like I started the book by just reading a lot of sociological literature about uh, the professional class. You know, there's a huge sociological literature on these guys, on this segment of society. And I and I said, you can basically interpret and understand everything that, that that the democratic party or that american liberals are going to do by uh by sort of projecting out this uh you know this sociological understanding of the professional elite they think they're right they think they should be in charge they think they should have a mute button on everybody else in society because they're right they're they have the credentials they're you know they went to uh, graduate school and you didn't they have an advanced degree and uh for them this is a no-brainer uh you know idiots are, are making stuff up on facebook and they should be made to be quiet because they don't they don't know what they're talking about and it's been especially true during covid by the way covid is culture war is starting to fascinate me now that it's almost over um God willing, it's almost over. By the way, I got vaccinated. We'll talk about that Good, later. So but I. I finally, I finally did it. So, uh, so I'm going to be, you know, free to, you know, do whatever I want in in a very short amount of time. But um, uh, during the COVID, uh, you know, the sort of masking wars, you saw this all over the place. Uh, you know, I don't know who to blame. Obviously, I think people should wear masks and should take precautions and should wash their hands and stay six feet apart. You know, I accept all of that advice. Uh, but uh, at the se I can see how people, uh, you know, the, the officiousness of uh, the sort of uh, um, professional elite in scolding the world. It's for also... Not it's also classic, uh, Thomas Frank. It's also just classic authoritarianism. That it, it, I, I think well, I think it's slightly different than other models of authoritarianism. But you tell me why you think it is that. Well, no, you tell. Well, I mean, oh, to because me, it's, it's it's so okay, friendly, right. and it's not. But it's not. It's not capitalism that's in charge. So my model of like fascism is uh, the business elite uh, telling right. everyone what to do. And and the thing is that the business elite is gone. They've uh, they've shot their bolt. Uh, you know, they, they, they're, it's, that's not a good metaphor. They've, so when I, you know, I did the research for the people know, and as, as recently as like the 1930s, the business elite were in charge in this country and professionals were a kind of, um, for the professional class was a second, you know, uh, they were a, a sort of, you know, a subaltern to, they, they did what their, what the business leaders right. did. So these are corp, they're led by corporate attorneys, corporate economists, that kind of thing. But today it's the other way around that people with advanced degrees are very much in the saddle in our culture and in our economy. They are in the, uh, the what, what's, what's the term that they use? The commanding heights of our civilization is the, is totally the professional elite. Uh, and uh, the business class is secondary. And so I always think of authoritarianism as the business class cracking down on us. This is something different. This is like, okay, you go now. Well, I, okay, Thomas Frank, I have a slightly different view, which is I think that the you know, professional and managerial class that you write about 
is an instrument. Uh, you know, I mean, nothing is ever black and white, right? So any simple sketch of uh, power relationships is going to be wrong. But I think that they are an inch. They use and are used by the business elites. So, you know, they know they have purchasing power. They use that purchasing power, for example, to get marriage equality for gay people and so on. But at the same time, by appealing to them, by sort of protecting the financial interests a bit and appealing to their social sensibilities, I think the business elites have also used them as a kind of uh, genteel shock troops for, uh, for this kind of democratic uh, neoliberalism that the party is so often represented. So I don't think it's either one way or another, but I think, you know, maybe authoritarian is the wrong word. Well, it's, it's like, a, not, it's like, it's, it's like, a ha authorita it's like a happy authoritarianism. It's authoritarianism yeah, it's, that really cares about you. It's hall monitoring authoritarianism. Yes, yes. You know, it's, it's, uh, eraser, the, that's the metaphor the of the erasers. decade, by the way, that's the right. metaphor of the decade, the right. hall monitor. Right. Uh, it's, it's, I'm telling authoritarianism, yeah. Yeah. you know, scolding. And, and, and the uh, utopia of scolding. Remember my uh, what Graeber? Uh, utopia no, no, that was that was my thing. The utopia of scolding. It's the last chapter of the people know. That's what the that's what the liberal ideal is now. It's a utopia oh, it of a utopia of utopia because they're these the people that I write about tend to be very affluent. You know, they live in these beautiful suburbs like Bethesda, like where like and like where you are, and and they uh, and they're both richer than everyone else, and they're better than everyone else. They're more righteous. They're, you know, they have the credentials. They know what's right and wrong, and they put these yard signs up saying, "We, you know, we're better people than you." All of this right. brings keeps bringing me back to that Clash song, "Working for the Clampdown." We put up the poster saying, uh, "We know more than you." It's we. They would say, "We earn more than you," but it's we know more than you. Working right. for the clampdown, and, and this is it's this is this anti this the censorship thing. This is the sexiest clampdown of them all. Everybody wants to get a piece of this of this action, you know, clamping down on on Trumpism. It's a way to silence uh, any view you don't like from left or right, while at the same time feeling profoundly self righteous about it because you're saving democracy. You know, we have it's it's like the village of Vietnam. We have to destroy democracy in order to save it. Exact, exact. And and Richard, I just want to th throw out here something, and I and I don't want to embarrass you by saying this, but you and I are a lot older than than a lot of people that are going to be watching this, and they might not remember that liberals once cared about free speech. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so you might want to do a little refresher there. Is it true that liberals once cared about free speech? It is. And uh, Tom, <laughs> God, I can confirm yes. that. I'm even older yeah, than yeah. you. This is another, it's just like, I have to tell people this because they don't know it. It's like, yeah, it was like who we were. It was essential. Right. It was at the core of who we were, that we tolerated offensive speech. We tolerated all kinds of stuff for a bunch of different reasons. One is because we, our understanding of democracy is that it is a conversation. There's all sorts of ideas out there, including ones that are, that are offensive and you have to tolerate them all. If you want to be tolerated yourself, that is democracy. Uh, and voters get to choose what, what, what you know what they want and that's you know that is our that is the liberal like justice brandeis understanding of democracy the other reason is that uh and this this is one like we said we were talking about earlier in the show if if we ever adopt a censorship regime in this country and there's a lot of people pushing for it right now you know who's going to be the first well or maybe the second but the biggest victims of it Maybe, maybe not not right off the bat, but soon it would be us. It would be people like us, just like it was Eugene Debs, just like in the 1950s. It, it happened as soon as the Trump victory or election happened, when the uh, when the uh, Directorate of National Intelligence report came out on the 2016 election, Clapper, known perjurer, you know, put his name on it. Uh, and I'll give myself credit for being on top of that right from the very beginning that this right winger gets elected president and this report comes out that blames the left, essentially, that singles out 
RT, Black Lives Matter, uh, people who are, are, are opposed to drone killings in the Middle East. I don't remember I mean, that. Is that right? Absolutely. I, oh, my I'll God. Pull it that's up. Just, that's, so I, I'm working on a history of the, the Trump left. era. That's, uh, that's, they, a, that's the Clapper report. They go straight for the left. Writing they always down. will. Counterpunch has been, you know, places like that, the Gray Zone, Max Blumenthal. They were all deprecated, to use the Wikipedia term, right away. I was off Twitter for eight months. Uh, tro well, why tro were you off Twitter for eight months? Uh, I've never gotten an answer. And oh, you got censored. I, apparently. So, I, so I oh, I, I have forgotten that. So I'm like, you know what I'm talking about. Then. I, don't, I don't have to prove said, it to you. <laughs> finally, somebody said, write to their lobbyist and CC your congressman, who at the time was Jamie Raskin. And oh. I was literally, after eight months, back on Twitter in 45 minutes. <laughs> so, but, and Troy will tell you that this program, you know, when we've tried to do things on uh racist racial violence they've demonetized uh, the videos on youtube because somehow yep. supposedly they can't distinguish between anti-racism and racism you well because their algorithm can't a human can but the but the algorithm can't you can't appeal that stuff though so it doesn't or it's very very hard so we're there i mean i know all about these forms of censorship but it's just as you were saying it's just common sense it, it, they may start out with the right, but of course they'll go to the left. The dirty secret to me is that a lot of the, uh, you know, erstwhile liberals that are calling for this uh, wouldn't really mind if the left. Yep. And would, I and would. I I mean there is examples here too. The so the the great the great sort of censorship, blacklisting, canceling moment of our time, although it's before I was born, was the of course the McCarthy period. Right. And you might remember that anti-communism was um, was embraced by the, the Truman administration right. because they were afraid of being seen as being soft on communism. And uh, they embraced it, but that didn't that didn't really help them. <laughs> you know, they, the right came after them and got a whole bunch of them, you know, because they're the ultimate effort of American anti-communism was to describe liberalism as communist so that all of these guys in the Roosevelt administration were supposedly um, right. spies for Russia. You know, that was the object. And by the way, and, and, you know, uh, there was not a whole lot of official censorship then there was some, but not a whole lot, but there was tons of lives ruined. People got canceled for just suspicions. Uh, you know, the idea of that you can just wreck someone's life uh, by throwing around innuendo around them. That's real. That happens. Yeah, sure. That's no joke. And it happened to people like us, people that you and I both know it happened to. Uh, it's it's not something that our side has any business fooling around with. Uh, you know, I couldn't agree more. And that's extremely well said. I, I also, you know, there's. Uh, there's a values issue here. You you alluded to it before when you, you mentioned that liberalism used to mean standing up for freedom of speech. I also feel that any political ideology or movement that doesn't revere the truth is either going to fail or if it succeeds, I'm not going to want to be around when it does. So, yes. and maybe I just got, yes. enough, maybe I got just enough journalistic DNA that if I, I want to know if a prevailing story isn't true, if yeah. the January 6th rioters really weren't intending, really didn't bring ties to tie up Congress people, I want to know that, even if it disrupts my my uh, millenarian fantasy about yeah, yeah the way that you you wanted to believe the very worst about them, and now you have to believe like the second very worst the about them. Worst. <laughs> yeah, but I'm just I want to know, even if it makes me. It, it, my, even if it makes my ideological argument harder to make. I know. I, it's, I, so this is not hard for me, okay? Right. Trump wasn't a Russian agent. He wasn't. Right. But he right. was still a really bad president, you know? I, it's like, I can still say that. It doesn't, I don't have to have, he doesn't have to actually be a, a Russian agent for me to understand how bad he was. <laughs> you right. know? It's not, it's not that tough. But there's this, there's this sense in which ever since 2016, liberals have been, uh, constantly trying to cover up for their own blunders. And rather than acknowledge what their mistakes were, 
So why did they lose that election? You know, and you can say, well, it was the Russians, but it was also, look, Hillary screwed up and they, they right. played, they played the game poorly. And there, you know, there's all sorts of reasons why, uh, why they lost. And they, and, and that was what, um, listen, liberal was about that, that they need to look in the mirror and see that they're on a long-term trajectory that, that leads to a very bad place. And one of these days, you and I need to get, get together and talk about where Biden fits in that, because so far he's, he seems to be, to be, like he understands all this and he's 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 looking for the way out which is wonderful but but by and large the democratic party as an institution does not understand that and liberals do not understand that and so rather than say wow we've really screwed up right over the years we, uh, uh, and we need to reassess and we need to to, to 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 go down a different course they're like no we need to make the other side shut up and right. the, and, it's and like, you know, I don't Tom, want to be part of that team. That's not, that's, you know, that's. Tom, that gets to, you know, to whatever extent I had adequate ethical training or any at all. I was always told, you know, when things go wrong, look at what you could have done better. I was never raised to believe when things go wrong, you know, blame the other guy. And if there's trying no to figure out a way to, yeah, I'm trying to figure out a way to get the other guy to, you know, fired from his job or something. Yeah. And if there's no plausible story to do that, make shit up. You know, that's, that, that was never, that's not supposed to be our moral training. Right. And yet to me, the lesson of this approach to liberalism and democratic party politics is, well, we lost. It's not because we ran a bad candidate or didn't have a clear platform or abdicated our our longstanding loyalty to the working class. It's it's a, it's about spies and you know mythical and you know Russian oligarchs are bad, but our oligarchs are good. You, you know, you know. To me, it's like, hey, stand up and own what you did wrong. I mean, yep. I'll do it. Yep. Why don't you? You know. And and look, it is scary. I mean, these guys are looking at. You know, you look at this at the, the election last in November, and uh, do you remember on election night for a brief period it looked like it was going like like they had screwed it, the pollsters had screwed it up again, and Trump actually well that was a shocker. And right. then when we finally did get the results, yes, the pollsters were wrong about all sorts of things. Uh, Trump was not sort of uh, uh, repudiated by uh, by the American public. It was fairly it was a fairly close election, uh, and there's all sorts Absolutely. of reasons all sorts of reasons to to believe that these guys are going to be right back. Um, uh, you know, the, we can argue, we can talk about that some other time too, because I think if Biden plays his cards right, he can, he can deal the Republicans a lasting defeat. We but, should, um, but I mean, I, I think, but, but, but right now it looks scary. These guys could be, they right. could be, you know, just biding their time and a smarter Trump is going to come down the road who doesn't make the obvious mistakes and who leads them into a colossal victory. And, you know, it's another kind of Jimmy Carter wipeout and it's, you know, 40 long years of this crap and liberals are like, they're looking at that and it is terrifying no uh, it's and i agree it is frightening uh, well if you kill as trump did half a million americans and you still almost get reelected, and from the democratic side the guy who killed half a million americans you could just barely beat him you know that calls for a little self-assessment too i mean i agree with you biden is well interesting. i don't know he's about approaching... killing half a million americans but he, he showed his leadership on covid was incredibly poor it's like the, the, well, i mean i'm being a little uh hyperbolic but but not much. well he certainly I mean, is he he's responsible for the he's responsible yeah he screwed it up oh my god did he ever and and the and the of course the the punchline is had he had he actually you know read a book about leadership or something <laughs> you know, like one of those corporate books about leadership and stepped up during the COVID pandemic, he would have been reelected easily. Yeah. Uh, and, well, but, but thank terrifying. goodness he was too, he's too, yeah. He, thank goodness he's too, you know, he, he's, he, he's too much of a narcissist to do, or, you know, he's lost in his own, you know, whatever hall of mirrors. He can't, couldn't figure that out. Uh, you know, couldn't do a anyhow. So we got lucky, and uh, and and the thing is now. Well, anyhow, the the, the great push from liberals is not let's figure it out and make sure that that these guys stay beat. Uh, it's let's right. let's make them shut up. And I'm I'm here to tell you, not only is that counter to everything that we've always stood for, and uh, if they ever do get back in charge, here's the thing: the right they have no problems with censorship. That's right, not a problem for them. That's not, you know, you give them those tools, you set those tools up, you say, yeah, censorship is okay. And you put them in charge. 
You want to scare? That's a lot? really bad idea. And second of all, you are feeding the grievance machine. These guys, if you ever watch Fox News, and do you remember I wrote a book called What's the Matter with Kansas about what makes the right tick? Why do they do this? You know, why do ordinary people enlist in a form of, you know, a political movement that doesn't serve their interests? Why do they do that? And um, a big part of it was that the right uses these uh, uh, class-based grievances. I mean, this is everywhere you go in right-wing land, these class-based grievances to promote this corporate agenda. They do it all the time, constantly. That is the name of the game for them. Well, this is the biggest one of all, to have a bunch of like, you know, uh, these fancy liberals in the suburbs shushing you. You think they're not going to be able to do, first of all, you're not going to be able to shut Fox News down, you know. You're not going to be able to make Glenn Beck shut up, you know. You, that's not going to happen. Um, all you're going to do is feed these people the biggest campaign issue, the biggest culture war issue of all time. Uh, and this is such a mistake. Want a scary thought, Tom? We're 20 percent of the way. I just thought of this this morning. We're 20 percent of the way to the 2022. Oh, wow. oh ah. there's not a lot of time to change the dynamic on this. And, um, you know, ignore ugh, last comment and then I'll, 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 I'll let you react to it. Yeah, of course, it's crazy to believe in QAnon and all that stuff. But we in the media, you know, our profession, right, of media, when you haven't been speaking to what's really going on in people's lives for 20, 30 years, when you've been repeating untrue, you know, I always go back to Martha Raddatz in the 2024, 2012 vice presidential debate uh, in which she was moderating so everybody knows social security is going broke whatever it is when did you, she really say that yes um well, what are you going to do about it and obama's answer was i suspect uh, mr romney and i have very similar views on this subject oh my god so that's i had forgotten a, that that's so that is so infuriating you of all people should remember that i just and, you got to understand the uh, the horizon the time thanks to covid the horizon is so limited yeah. now i only think about uh, things in the but the point of uh, my point about the media is when you've been out of touch with people and I'm talking obviously about the, uh, you know, the corporate media largely, but and have been missing the story, which is the story of their lives and have been misreporting certain things. Uh, OK, you've lost some credibility that creates a space for fantasists to inhabit yep. narratives that give cohesion to people's lives, even if they're luna lunacy, at least they say, okay, now I understand the world around me. And it seems yeah. to me it's our responsibility. And and, and I would also point out, I would just throw out there that in addition to, you know, and you can, you and I can go down the list and talk about all the media mistakes of the last, you know, couple decades, you know, some of them just enormous whoppers, like, like WMD, you know, right. uh, which is the, for the younger listeners is, has to do with the Iraq war and our, our reasons for going in there, which were made up and the media largely accepted them uh, or the, you know, their complete failure on the, on the uh, financial crisis. I mean, there's, there's many of them, right? Their complete failure in the 2016 election to see what was actually happening. You can add all those up, but, and then Russiagate, of course, which is just uh, is a catastrophic failure of the media, but, an even bigger fact, they're gone from a huge part of the country. You know, every small town, well, not every small town, but like I was in a small town in Missouri a while ago. And and I and I remember, um, well, this is the building where our newspaper used to be. Right. <laughs> the newspaper is gone. I mean, I'm from a big city, Kansas City, two, population, you know, the metro area is two million people that had a great newspaper once. It's today. It's it's a sh it's a sliver. It's nothing. It's printed in Iowa. I think their their staff, you know, their their um, their uh, uh, their newsroom is what a dozen reporters, maybe. Uh, and well, they still cover sports really well. They're very good on that. But it's they don't they don't come out on Saturdays. It's not even a daily paper anymore. It's this is happening everywhere that that the whole, uh, you know, the idea of, uh, you know, the American model of news gathering and the news media, that model is dead. It is it is it doesn't serve Americans anymore. And in the absence of that, yeah, you have people making up all kinds of crazy stuff. That's what yeah. happens, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and those are the financial incentives. And, uh, you know, I can't bring myself to do it. And uh, I paid the price, you know? So, uh, 
So I think we'll have to leave it there. Some is something happening on your end, Mr. Frank? Oh yeah, I got a I got a package. It appears to be from the UK, although I don't know what I'm getting from the UK. I expected something else. I expected Did something from Wichita, it? Kansas. <laughs> Should you X-ray it or something before you open it or submerge it in the water? Um, all right. Well, Thomas Frank, his latest book is The People, Comma, No. What's the subtitle? An anti, a history of anti a brief history of anti populism. People right. who hate, people who hate uh, democracy, basically mass right. democracy. Yeah, uh, a movement anti populism that has seen quite a resurgence in recent years. Oh yes, so, oh yes. A timely book, and uh, his recent column at uh, the Guardian. Liberals want to blame right wing misinformation for our problems. Get real. So with that, Thomas Frank, as always, thanks for coming on the program. Great talking with you. Richard, the pleasure's all mine. And we will be right back after this. I'm Richard R.J. Eskow. I'm putting my glasses on. Oh. <laughs> and this is The Zero Hour. <laughs>